Our message today is entitled, Finding Hope. The story is told of Joey Mora, a Marine Corporal, in 1996, was standing on the platform of an aircraft carrier when the ship apparently was tossed about by a wave. Unexpectedly, he was cast off the edge overboard. For the first 36 hours, no one knew that he was missing. A massive search was launched for the man overboard. Twenty-four hours after the search began, his parents were notified that he was missing at sea and presumably dead. Can you imagine one moment standing aboard an aircraft carrier, feeling fully secure, with a full realization that this huge ship isn't going to be tossed about, and in the next split second being cast into the ocean without any life preserver or anyone being aware of what has just happened. From going from a sense of security to wondering moment by moment if you're going to live. Life sometimes tosses us about, doesn't it? Joey's marine training kicked in as he hit the water. He took his short, his pants off, tied them in a knot, swung them over his head to make uh, a man-made preserver, light preserver, leaned into it and paddled and swam as best he could hour after hour, hoping that somebody would find him. Day one slipped in to day two. Day two slipped in to day three. But the survival training and instincts just continued automatically. After 70 hours at sea, off in the distance, four Pakistani fishermen in a boat spotted something on the high seas and decided to paddle towards it. There they found him sleeping but dog paddling at the same time. Strangers, strangers they were, but life and rescue came forward. What, it, what would it be like to be in his situation? Two years later during an interview, he said the most excruciating of all was one thought that pounded through my body and in my head. Amidst all of this water, I have no water. As they pulled him into that little boat, his lips were cracked, his throat was parched, but he was alive. But there's one thing that he wanted, and that was water. Oh, oh, to go from security to insecurity in a split second, to go from life 
as we know it, to life as unexpected, to go from employed to unemployed, to go to a doctor's visit to find out we're not healthy, to find papers on the table that that say our marriage of 25 years are in jeopardy and I no longer want to live with you, to find out that your child is doing drugs, to deal with issues that come up so suddenly. How do we handle it? How do we find hope in what sometimes is the most hopeless situation? I would invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. For there we find the story of Jesus. And there we will pick up some key lessons from the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well today, that we might apply them to our lives. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. He being Jesus left Judea and departed again unto Galilee, and he needed to go through Samaria. Then he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied of his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour of the day. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Let me set just a little context here. From, uh, from Judea to Galilee is a distance of about 120 miles. Thank you for turning your cell phones off. It was about a distance of 120 miles. It would be covered typically in about three days. If you took the most direct route from Galilee uh, and headed straight north through Samaria, excuse me, if you took the direct route from Judah uh, through, Ga through Samaria <laughs> to Galilee, you would go through uh, Samaria. And that was Jesus' plan. Now, can you imagine walking 120 miles? We think that driving from here to Ridgecrest, which is a two and a half, three hour drive, is rather arduous ordeal to maybe have to come back and drive all the way. You were conditioned, and as uh, people in those days were very conditioned, and as they would walk along, uh, they would converse, and it was a much slower pace of life. When Jesus hit uh, Samaria, he uh, came to the well. Now you have to understand the context here. The Jews and Samarians were not best of friends. They had 700 years of bad blood. The Jews thought that they were the holy people of God, called of God, and the Samaritans were not to be talked to. There was a rift and a division. If you were a good Jew, you would just consider them non persona. You would walk by them, not make eye contact, and just keep going. One of the interesting lessons that I learned from this is the lesson that Jesus asks for help from strangers. Jesus asked for help from a stranger. I don't know how it is with you, friend, but I would find it hard to go up to somebody I didn't know or didn't know very well and ask them for help. Excuse me, sir, could you drive me 20 miles? Excuse me, at the gas station, could you put about $8 worth of gas in my car? God needs me to go see this person. There's an interesting thing about human nature. That which we are comfortable with and the people that we know and love, we are comfortable around. But strangers are 
strangers, and they belong to somebody else, and they're somebody else's responsibility. Now, when Jesus was walking here on this earth, he came to this earth to do his Father's what? To do his Father's will and to glorify the Father. And if he was doing something, he was doing it for a reason and for a purpose. And he was modeling the Father's will for us. So lesson number one that I take from this story is Jesus asks for help from strangers. I believe he's patterning something for us. There are some people that you don't know now who you will never get to know unless you're proactive in establishing a relationship with them. There are some people, if you ask them for help and you don't know them, who are willing to help you. Do you realize that in this world there are means far beyond this congregation that are available to God if we would just go seek them? There are people that would be in the pews today if we would just go and invite them. Do you realize that every need of God is supplied for before we ask for it? Jesus went out and invited strangers to help him. It's counterproductive in most of our natures to do that. Would you agree? We're real comfortable in church, most of us. And in the lobby, we might ask somebody for a ride home. But to go to a stranger, hmm. But Jesus was doing his Father's will. In that passage, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, just something small. In the middle of the day, with the sun at its highest, Jesus' lips were cracked, his throat was parched. He had journeyed across the hot, dry ground, and there he came to the well, not having any ability to draw from that well. Now, I find this somewhat mildly interesting. Here is the creator of the universe sitting beside the well, and at just his command, the water would have gushed from that well like Old Faithful. But he chose not to do that. He chose to reach out into this woman's soul. There's something unique about women, the way that women are wired, the way that women think that men only begin to barely comprehend. Would you agree, ladies? Okay, we're, we're together. So he looks at this woman and says, here is somebody that needs eternal life. It's high noon. How did he arrive at that? He knows her heart. He knows everything about her. And he could have just said, follow me. Follow me, and I will take you through to the kingdom. But he doesn't do that. He asks her for something. Verse 9 says, Then saith um, Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the town and in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asks me a uh, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the, uh, what does your Bible say? Samaritan. She knew her place, and her place was not to be talking to a Jew. Oh, we've, we've read this story dozens and dozens and dozens of times. I read it probably 25 or 30 times this week. And I said, Lord, why is this story in here? We know it so well. But you have to understand it in context. In the flow of John, John chapter 3 and then John chapter 4, 
Here's a Jew talking to a Samaritan. Not only is it a Samaritan, it's a woman. And women know their places. It's somewhere way beyond or behind a man. I want to apologize to the ladies here for any indifference that either the men of this church or the broader church has projected to you or upon you. For you see into our lives, I believe that the Samaritans in this story represents a group of people that we face every day. Have you found the Samaritans in your life? Those people that are on the subway when you go to work, those people you walk by on the street, God, thank you that you took me out of the gutter. I hope somebody will help that person out of the gutter. God, thank you that I'm not like them. Those people that we walk by that need the wellspring that Jesus can give them. Those people who are non-persona. Have you found the Samaritan in your life that God wants you to talk to, friends? The teaching of this story is not a story isolated in the context of 2,000 years ago. The teaching of this story reaches down through the corridors of time to today. Have you found the Samaritan in your life today that needs the hope of eternal life? Follow along. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew ask me of a drink, which am a which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou would have asked me, and he would have given thee living water. I like this exchange. Jesus is just, just in the moment. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows the direct approach with this woman. A direct calling out would not do. He is telling her by story, how is it you're willing to give me of the water of this well? But the wellspring of life is right before you now. And if you realized it, you would be asking me for it. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? How is it that Jesus can be so close and yet so far away? How is it you can be so hopeless and not aware of it? And Jesus is right there. It must have been very awkward for that woman. She scratched her head for a moment, so to speak, and she wondered, what's this riddle that this man is telling me? I don't get it. Do you get it when I say that? When I say that is to suggest that people that don't have a close relationship with God don't get it because they don't have the Spirit of God working in their heart. You can't tell somebody about the gospel before inviting them and engaging them and telling them about how the gospel works in your life. Because the Spirit of God may be working in your life, but it hasn't clicked in their life yet. But it's going to for her, and it's going to to the Samaritans that you're going to come across next week. Those at work, those on the subway, those that ring your doorbell, those that irritate you, all of those people, you know who they are, don't you? Do you pass them scores every week and every month? And surely somebody, the pastor, will tell them about Jesus. Surely they will hear a radio message. Surely somebody will contact them. Or surely I'll ask them about Jesus. 
How is it as we look at what Jesus did and how we are living? The lesson is that Jesus was proactive in reaching out to the Samaritan woman. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw from the well, and the well is deep. She still didn't get it. How are you going to bring forth water from this well? The well is deep and you have nothing, Jesus. How is it that you're going to bring forth water from whence thou, um, that thou shalt have living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself, his children, and the cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drink, uh, whosoever shall drink of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall bring be unto him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Something happens in the Samaritan uh, the Samaritan woman's mind and heart. She starts to get it. She starts to understand. He has nothing to draw from this well. But if she, if, if I believe what he's saying, the emptiness in my life, if he's the wellspring of life, if he can bring the hope into my shattered life, Let's see, I've gone through husband number one, number two, number three, number four. And how is it? It's high noon when most of the time the ladies of the town come at sunrise. I come at noon not to be embarrassed or snickered as I gather at the well. And here he's talking to me about a well that will never run dry. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw again. And Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman said, As you know, the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Well, I have no husband, for you have five husbands. And he said that thou hast not thy husband, in that thou sayest thou truly. And the woman said, I perceive that thou art what? A prophet. Oh, I like this story. I just love this story. Jesus could tell her all about her life, but he tells her just enough, just enough to let her know that he knows and the Spirit of God impresses her to believe him. She goes from a state of unbelief. She goes from a state of hopelessness, being an outcast, being considered um, being considered of the lowest caste in town, four times married, living with a man, not worthy to come to the well with the other women. The woman said on her, Sir, I perceive that thou art what? A prophet. Now, let me ask you a question. You're good Bible students. Who told the woman that Jesus was a prophet? What do you think? What? Okay, the Holy Spirit did, right? Did she realize that truth on her own? Did she just say, hmm, that guy's got a lucky guess? Uh-uh, uh-uh. We're going to look just a minute. They, wor they worship me in spirit and what? Truth. Truth. There's a critical key here. Before you tell them the truth, what has to work? The Spirit of God, so that they will believe the truth. The Holy Spirit worked on the heart and in the mind of that woman. When Jesus said, you, you're right. Uh, Jesus said, you have... Uh, you're right, you're not married to your last husband, but you've had four husbands and now are living with a man. But the hour cometh and now is, verse 23 says, um, let me back up, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Um, verse 22 says, you worship 
you know not what? We know that we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus, again, seeks to seeks to plant that truth deep within this woman's heart. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She didn't get it with the water. She wasn't quite getting it with him being the Messiah. But Jesus plants that peace deep within her heart. Finding hope. I'm glad. One of the spiritual lessons here is I'm glad that Jesus is patient. He is patient in working with the ones that we love. And I wonder how we are when we, when we share, when we find that Samaritan, when we tell our brother, our mom, our dad, our sister, our spouse about Jesus. You gotta, you gotta receive it right now because it's truth. The truth is they will receive it, but the Holy Spirit needs to work in and uh, in them and through them to open their hearts first. Do you believe that, friends? We are powerless without the Spirit of God going before in sharing the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is spirit and truth, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The last piece and the last lesson from this exchange is in verse 29. The woman was so excited um, that she left Jesus, left her water pot, and went to the city after bringing up some water for Jesus and said to the men, <laughs> I like this, again in John, come and see which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? And they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed and said, Master, eat. And he said on them, I have no meat to eat, and you that you know I have meat to eat that you know not of. And Jesus um, allowed them par to partake of the meal. It's an interesting thing to me that this story is positioned in John chapter four, because there's a real subtle nuance here. Why would John 2,000 years ago write this story that it might apply to our lives today? In John chapter 3, just by way of reflection, we looked at a man who came to Jesus. Who came to Jesus. His name was what? Nicodemus. When did Nicodemus come to Jesus? By night. Nicodemus, what uh, religious persuasion was Nicodemus? He knew the teachings of Jesus, and he didn't have this rebirth experience quite figured out. He was one seeking. He came by night. So you have Nicodemus coming by night. Who is Jesus coming to in broad daylight? Just by, just by opposites. Here's a nighttime interchange where Nicodemus seeks out Jesus, and here's a lady who just at the opposite end of the spectrum in broad daylight is not seeking Jesus, but Jesus is seeking her. <laughs> do, 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 it's almost whimsical. That is to say, the first person doesn't quite get it, being Nicodemus, what it means to be born again. And the second person is also clueless, but more receptive. I find it interesting when you compare the two. I find it interesting how through the stream of time we have somewhat ignored, we have somewhat set up casts, we have somewhat said somehow. Somehow men are better than women. I don't find that to be very Christian. Do you? I don't find that in the teachings of Christ. 
I find that Christ is calling everyone here, male, female, young, old, skinny, <laughs> skinny plump was the word I was looking for. We come in all different shapes, all different sizes, in all different personalities. And Jesus calls all of us and values all of us. So what does it mean to be filled of the Spirit? What does it mean to have this wellspring of life? We, we use these images. How does the water of life come into my heart and life? John chapter 7, verse 37, our closing thought today. John chapter 7, verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come on to me and drink. He who believes in me, so the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom thou believed in him, were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some people therefore heard these words and were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others said, surely this is the Christ, is not coming from Galilee. He is not, has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem? the village where David was, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. It's an amazing story. It's a simple story. It's a simple story that an eight-year-old can understand. But what, what is this being filled with your spirit and having a living fountain flowing out of your heart and life. I don't know how it is in your life, friends. I don't know if you feel like you're the Samaritan today, or if you feel like the righteous Jew, or if you feel like the saint, or if you struggle with internal battles, if you have little hope, or your heart is filled with great hopes today. But I know you can find hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to share with you just a, a simple illustration. Sometimes we think that we have to clean up our hearts and our lives. And we know that Jesus will certainly help us, but we have to do our own part. I'd like to suggest the glass is the human heart. And being good followers of Christ, we kind of pick at this. You'll notice the stuff in here is white. So it's good things that sometimes overtake us. It's working 20 hours a day while you're neglecting your family. It's being overly possessive of your children without training them how to take care of themselves. And we start picking away. And just as soon as we pick away and we do pretty good, and we got, got it about half, half cleaned up. The problem is, about the time we have it half cleaned up, the devil's pouring in other things. But Jesus said, there's a wellspring from the throne of grace that he wants to pour in to your heart and life that will drive up it will drive off those things in your heart that are not of God. It will take the parched heart and be watered from it. It will give life. That spirit will, will refresh it, reinvigorate it. I believe he indeed is the wellspring of life. As he pours his life 
into our hearts. His Spirit crowds out those things that are unlike Him. And He continually pours in His purity. And our hearts are made new by His Spirit. For those who worship Him in spirit, and in truth. Let us pray. Father, you have given us so many amazing, simple stories that continually remind us of your goodness and grace. Father, fill our hearts with your Spirit. Take and make them pure today. Give us, Father, the Spirit of Christ. May we find the stranger that is within our sphere and share with them the amazing, life-giving waters of Christ, that they too may find the hope that we have. We thank you, Father, that in our hour of need, in our hour of desperation, we can move from little or no hope to finding hope as we turn to Jesus. Fill us, Lord, we ask through Christ's precious name. Amen.